It's the sound of ideas from Ideas Stream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for joining us and uh, happy Thursday to you. Earlier this week, the Sound of Ideas brought you a conversation about the state of independent music venues in the region. Many of those institutions are still reeling from the pandemic, experiencing lagging attendance numbers, and are experiencing financial strains due to supply chain issues and inflation. Well, that story of economic uncertainty is being felt throughout another arts landscape, theaters. Playhouses of all sizes are also experiencing rises rising costs as they forge ahead with new seasons in an industry still reckoning with pandemic challenges. To kick off today's program, we'll get a sense of how area theaters are faring. Stick and stick around as later in the hour, we'll introduce you to our new Sound of Us series and finally another episode of our music podcast Shuffle. But first this morning, let me welcome IdeaStream Public Media's Deputy Editor of Arts and Culture, Carrie Wise. She spoke with several area theaters about how they're dealing with current issues, as well as what's going on and what's going well for the industry. So, Carrie, glad to have you on the Sound of Us table for the first time, I think, live with you. It's yeah, exciting for me. Good to be here. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. If you'd like to join the conversation or have theater questions, Give us a call at 866-578-0903 or 216-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org or you can tweet us. We are at Sound of Ideas. So, Carrie, let's let's start with something positive. I understand that theaters are indeed starting to see audiences return at higher levels than expected this season. So kind of paint a picture for us of, of what the theaters are seeing. Yeah. So that is good news. More people are in the audiences for shows this fall season better than expected was some of the ways it's been characterized. Uh, there's been a momentum. It feels like things have finally started to feel a little bit more like normal, although there's a lot lot that's still challenging at this time. The the audience levels, the, it ranges from theater to theater, but roughly 10 to 20 percent pre-pandemic levels. So still want to get more people in the theaters. Um, but I'm also hearing that actually what's challenging is the unpredictability of audiences now. People are not booking their tickets way in advance. They're not necessarily subscribing. As many people are not necessarily subscribing to theaters, so then they're kind of choosing a la carte what they want to see. And so all of these things make it difficult for theaters to know how many people are going to be in the seats Thursday night for their productions. I mean, that's like when we have our pledge drive drives and what really helps our station is that predictability and those sustaining members. So I guess the same might be said for a theater. And was that predictability something that they really had pre-pandemic? You know, people saying, I'll get a subscription for tickets, things, or at least getting their tickets further in advance? Yeah, I think pre-pandemic, you would certainly have seen that. But let's be honest, in the industry, that's been a trend that's been going down oh, over see. time. So not as many people have been doing that um, over time. And this is something that's happening for theaters everywhere. So all theaters are kind of grappling with that and trying to make sure that they're doing things like marketing shows throughout the entire run. To, it's not right. just opening night and letting people know, hey, we're still, we're here, we're putting this on and and really reaching out to to often new audiences. So what were some of the theaters and theater owners that you spoke with um, for this latest round of reporting? Yeah, so I spoke with, in Cleveland with Caramu House, Great Lakes Theater here in Playhouse Square. I spoke with Cleveland Playhouse and Great Lakes Theater in Lakewood. I spoke with the Beck Center of the Arts and in Cleveland Heights, Dobama Theater. So really a variety of theaters that produce different types of productions. And I also spoke with the head of the national group, theater communications group. They do uh, research and advocacy. And so it was interesting to see that truly the issue of rising costs Mm. is, is something that's nationwide like so we're talking about center. inflation inflation is a big part of it but so what how does inflation hit theaters it, it hits it in prices to buy things sure. like for your sets costumes etc uh but the other thing that's you know a major piece is is labor is paying people mm. so several things have happened so during covid People left the theater industry. Theaters closed, as everyone knows, for a long period of time. So that some people got different work. So now if those people didn't come back 
there's some shortages and in, in some competition to get people to do some certain jobs. Sure. Wages are up in that regard. Wages are also up as theaters are facing a real reckoning. They, that, that happened during COVID, too. That's like, hey, we want to support one another. We right. want there to be equity in pay. We want to have humane working conditions. So that's changing things from like how many hours you're asking artists to work. And so uh, obviously it's not as high a paying work as corporate sure, <laughs> environments, sure. um, but, but things are moving up. And so that's definitely changing uh, theaters. To get into some of the examples sure. of what theaters, some of the things theaters are doing, here's Nathan Mata. He's executive uh, or he's artistic director at Obama Theater in Cleveland Heights. We did a lot of soul searching during the pandemic and looked at our production model and we added a week of rehearsal to every process to make it more sustainable. Things that in our industry that were and are uh, standard, we kind of examined as many theaters did and kind of looked at whether it was the most sustainable and humane way to approach uh, what we were doing. So I'm curious, how does an extra week of rehearsal add to the sustainability for those of us who kind of aren't in the know? Yeah. So instead, you're not working as long. Got it. You're not there all night, you know, and then back again the next day. You know, it's it's making that more uh, doable. I think you're right. And that's interesting. I think it can be applied to all industries. I do think that something happened in the pandemic. Like you said, people left work, the great resignation and all of those things. And then in order to attract people back to an industry, there did seem to be a kind of more human driven approach to hiring and employment, that feeling of people want work life balance. They wanted to be treated with dignity. You know, they don't want to resent their job. You want to make your place of work desirable. So it's interesting to see that that was also happening in the theater space as well. Absolutely. So now you're paying people more and that's Mm -hmm. a good thing. But, um, you know, I'm sure there is limited profitability for theaters. So how are they offsetting things? How are they able to pay staff more, have that longer week, um, you know, that extra week of rehearsal, but still, um, make some money and keep the doors open for these theaters? All good questions. So there's a lot of creativity that happens to make all this work. Um, So, you know, a couple things. First of all, the theaters have said that the pandemic relief funding has Mm. really helped them get to this point. So those funds have helped them, Um, you know, and then really each theater is a little bit different about how they're adjusting. I'm definitely hearing that some of the extras that you might have, you know, had a big vision and wanted to go sure. big on something. Well, we're, you, this might not be the time where you go big with something experimental um, and expensive. Uh, the budgets are definitely a lot tighter in that regard. And then there are some cases where things are actually being cut. Uh, Cleveland Public Theater was candid to say that uh, executive artistic director there, Raymond Bobkin, said, Staff cuts are up 30%, mm. but then programming is in turn down 30%. So they're making cuts. We just talked about to Obama Theater. They reduced their season by one show. Oh, so, interesting. you know, there's just adjustments a that are being made. A little, yeah. In some regards, you know, some theaters are a little bit more holding steady. Um, but this is something, again, that's that's happening nationally. And those national cuts... Uh, where where there's national programming cuts, that ha- that hurts here too. Okay, there can be fewer opportunities for for actors to mm-hmm. travel. There could be fewer opportunities for new plays and new play development. Right, which is certainly something that some of our theaters, like Cleveland Public Theater, it, it does that work. So you know when the, this is happening across the industry, it is there's a ripple effect here. Sure, I want to read an email from listener Brian. Um, He sent an article related to Caremu House receiving a grant for some renovations. He says, tip of the hat and congrats to them, the oldest continuously operating African-American theater in the country. So, um, you know, definitely uh, 
theaters have an important impact on our region, and everyone knows kind of that cultural importance of them. And uh, it does it, it does seem gratifying when you know that they are getting help in ways that mi- they might need to sustain and to grow and, and to continue their work here. Absolutely. Yeah, Karamu House has been undergoing capital improvements and renovations. Um, and so that support is going to help them do their work well into the future. So we were talking a little bit before the show about the personality of the productions that we're seeing um, in Cleveland, and you were saying how there has been a shift. So why don't you tell me more and our listeners more about that? Well, I think the shift that's happening is that (laughs) theaters are trying to really know what what to program. Sure. In some cases, they want to recognize what it speaks to audiences. It's part of that. How do you bring in new people? How do you grow your audience? As well as how do you speak to the moment? What shows are really work with audiences? I spoke with Great Lakes Theater about their opening production. They opened their season with Natasha Pierre in The Great Comet of 1812. And that is not a particularly well-known musical. Um, So they were a little nervous about that. Sure. But it's a very vibrant and fun show and so they did see success with that production that kind of was more than what they thought but it was also a um you know a fun musical and i think that there's definitely an interest in many theater goers to just have an evening or afternoon of fun yeah no definitely um I saw the Tina Fey, Amy Poehler kind of comedic night. And, you know, I I know them. I've read their books, watch them on SNL. And I think for me that night was, you know, an opportunity to go have dinner and then go see the show and have a bit of levity and lightness and and a bit of escapism. And I knew I was going to have some laughs. And I think there is something about, uh, you know, during the pandemic, I didn't go to any shows. You know, I barely went to one movie Um, you know, towards the end of the pandemic. So I think, you know, anecdotally, I can kind of speak to what people are looking for when they want to go downtown or to any parts of Northeast Ohio to kind of see a show and and feel like you're taken away for, for a bit. Absolutely. So now, is COVID still impacting the theaters? Are we seeing those Very ripple much. effects on, on how they are um, presenting to the public? Yeah, so... Obviously, there's no Zoom option where you can right. work from home. Uh, right. If you're the star of a show, you know, that's a real issue if you come down with COVID. Now, a lot of theaters have made understudies the regular thing and beefed up the, you know, the number of under, understudies. But that's an added cost, and not every show can, can handle that. And so there is still that threat of cancellations, of having to cancel a few performances that happened recently at the Beck Center with a show. And uh, Cleveland Playhouse said that over the last several productions, they've had cases pop up. They were able to avoid cancellations with some backfilling and some understudy work. But it's still a very much real issue. And theaters are doing things to try to, you know, take precautions. Cleveland Playhouse said they masked for their rehearsals for their most Mm. recent production, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely still an issue. So I'm curious, and unfortunately, we're going to have to close out our conversation because I could talk to you all morning. But uh, how are the theaters working together? Like, I certainly see, at least at Playhouse Square, the new marquees, the lighting. It looks very vibrant and alive, and it's, you know, very enticing for kind of the personality of downtown Cleveland. But how, how are the theaters in other ways collectively working together to make sure that the industry is doing well or supporting each other? Well, I think this is a moment where theaters are really going to look to figure out how they do work more together. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tony Sias, who is the CEO of Caramu House, had this to say about working together collaboratively. We as a community have an opportunity to come together and have conversations in ways that we have not had historically with any frequency as an industry and as a community. I would hope that we would seize the opportunity to see how we talk about shared resources and non-traditional ways of supporting each other that help reduce cost and that increase access across the board. So that real sense of uh, kind of collective shared responsibility to, to help the industry move forward is, is what I'm hearing from him. Yeah, definitely. So this could take many shapes, Jenny. It could be training. So Karamu House is working to beef up a, a 
technical training program to help fill some of the need for workers in that regard, and that could benefit the region. Uh, you could see co-productions. They're presenting a show here. Caremu House is presenting a show here in Playhouse Square in tandem with Cleveland Playhouse, Black Nativity, this winter. They did this last year, and they're doing nice. it again this year. And so you could see co-productions. Um, an idea that was floated nationally was the idea of can theaters share their scene shops and so, you know, I think that this is a moment where people can get creative about ways that they could work together. Carrie Wise, Idea Stream Public Media's Deputy Editor of Arts and Culture. Carrie, great to speak with you this morning. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. And for anyone interested in diving more in depth on the topic, we have a written story about the new normal for Cleveland area theaters on our website. That is ideastream.org. Time now for a quick break. On the other side, we're going to talk about our newest Sound of Us series, which focuses on the institution of marriage. This is the Sound of Ideas. I'm Jenny Hamill. We'll be right back. Nine twenty two, you're tuned to the Sound of Ideas right here on WKSU Idea Stream Public Media, where support for our programming today comes from Direct Energy, providing a choice when it comes to supplying a home's electricity and natural gas. More information on simple, straightforward energy plans at directenergy.com/choice. Oberlin Opera Theater presenting Benjamin Britten's comedy, Albert Herring, November 2nd through 5th at Oberlin College's Hall Auditorium. More information at oberlin.edu slash artsguide. Two statewide issues on reproductive rights and marijuana will be decided Tuesday, November 7th, along with local issues regarding Cleveland City budget, council and school board races in Akron, and Canton's next mayor. Join us election night here on WKSU for updates at the top of the hour and head to ideastream.org for our live blog and analysis. We'll also provide updates on Ideastream public media's Instagram and threads. It's all part of Ideastream's Listen, Engage, Vote 2023. You're with the Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for being with us this hour. Ideastream's Sound of Us aims to tell the stories of Northeast Ohioans through their own voices. Over the years, this series has shared the stories of the region's LGBTQ plus youth, immigrants and refugees settling in Northeast Ohio, and a series of individuals on the autism spectrum talking about their own experiences. Well, last week, the Sound of Us series launched its newest iteration, Stories of Marriage, which shares stories about, you guessed it, marriage. Marriage rates in the United States remain low, and I didn't, I was surprised by this, for every 1,000 unmarried adults, only 34 tied the knot in 2022. This newest Sound of Us series not only focuses on those folks who remain unmarried, but also how people that are in unions are making them work. A lot of hard work, right? Joining me now in studio to talk about the latest series is Justin Glanville, senior producer for Community Storytelling, who heads up the Sound of Us projects. Justin, great to see you. Hey, Johnny. We also have in studio Charlotte Morgan, one of the storytellers in this series. Charlotte, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. And Lisa Chu, another one of the storytellers in the series. She's here as well. Lisa, thanks so much for coming in as well. Sure. Thanks for having me. And if any of you in our audience would like to join the conversation, any of our listeners, call 866-578-0903 or 216-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. So, Justin, you always tell us the story of how the Sound of a series comes to be. But what was the inspiration for this particular series on marriage? Yes. OK, so I'm going to try not to be too long winded here. So so every year, Jenny, we try to do at least one direct training where we're going out into the community and, and offering the tools and of the trade for audio storytelling to people who are interested. So this time we worked with Literary Cleveland, which is a nonprofit in Cleveland that uh, offers all kinds of workshops on writing in various formats. 
And we connected with a really wonderful group of storytellers, including the two women that you'll hear from today. And they were trained by a great radio journalist named Trent K. Maverick over a 10-week workshop. Nice. And it just emerged really early on that marriage was a topic that a lot of people were interested in talking about. And we've never tried that approach before where we have like a theme and then people make stories about that theme. But we thought, let's try it in this case. And it turned out to be a really wonderful series. So, Charlotte, we'll start with you. You are not married. But in your piece, you tell the story of Marsha and Joseph, who have been happily married for decades. So tell us how you got involved in the storytelling project and kind of what your approach ended up being. All right. So I got involved with the project through, again, Literary Cleveland. And I, again, I can tell a story about anything. You know, I've been challenged. Can you tell a story about a rock? I can tell you a story about a rock. I can tell you a story about anything. And so for this particular project, I always wanted to tell the story about Marsha and Joe Thomas's marriage because I happened to be there the night they met. And, you know, I love old movies, old black and white movies. And there's this term called the cute meat or the meat cute. And so in in learning how to be a screenwriter, there was always that term. And I never got a chance to use it for anything until this class. And so I realized I had a cute meat. Joe and Marsha meet across a crowded room at the Palace Theater. Love it. And... There you have it. And that's how the story came to be. I think I follow Cute Me in New York City. So it's an Instagram account and they just approach couples and say, how'd you meet? And it's so charming and endearing and it makes you kind of romantic. So, um, Lisa, I want to ask you, your piece focuses on greeting cards and specifically (laughs) anniversary cards. So what led you to focus on that for the story? So I think we are thinking about like our cohort. We are talking about marriage and celebrating marriages and how long people have been married. Um, And I know with me and some of my friends, we would always kind of joke about the longer you're married, the harder it is to find an appropriate card that captures your relationship. Like, you know, some of us would be like, Where's the card that says I tolerate you? Sure. <laughs> you know? So it just started from that. And then um, in this workshop, as we talked about it, like everybody kind of responded like, yeah, but greeting cards, how do you find the right one? And you used to make your own, right? So I, your whole thing was like, yeah. how do I find a card that's going to measure up? To I, I used to, but yeah, then you get, you know, the longer you're married, the more you're like, I think I'll just go to the drugstore. <laughs> um and try and try my luck and try to find one that matches. So what's your own experience with the cards? You're making them or you used to make them, but are I you are you to. sending them? I used to make cards like really fancy ones. Like I would take a, our leftover wedding invitations and like cut up little hearts and shapes and oh, things. How fun. Yeah, now I just buy them. <laughs> are they romantic? Well, or are they you don't bug me so much today. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. So for one thing is like I just don't have a sense of direction. Like, I get lost all the time. Sure. You're spatially challenged. Totally. I don't have that. I'm just missing that. Um, So I usually find something that, like, if it has a compass or if it says, like, like, you know, you help me. I I love navigating this life with you or you help me find my way. Like, it's, like, literally, like, he literally helps me find my way. So I'll find that. I won't do, like, flowery, you know, romantic Right. You're the love of my life stuff that right. just Lisa's story has a great punchline. Not gonna so work. I just like listen to her story. And one thing that was fun too is Jenny, like obviously we're a greeting card town, right? With American yes. greetings. Sure, of course. Here. So one really fun <laughs> aspect of Lisa's story was she interviewed someone who used to work for American Greetings and he really pulled back the curtain on oh. what goes into creating a greeting card. And it's not super romantic. And not at all. <laughs> he was like it's super analytical. It's like lots of spreadsheets and stuff. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Well, there does seem to be a card for every feeling and, and theme. And, and you're kind of like, oh, that's exactly what I was thinking. So, I mean, to hit all those points, you got to hit like almost every aspect of humanity. <laughs> right. So I'm sure there's a science behind that. Charlotte, in your audio piece, we hear Marsha and Joseph talk about how they're actually opposites. So 
tell us about their same values and what makes them work well as a couple. And then also, you know, as someone who's unmarried, what's your reaction to that, to see this couple that you obviously admire or wanted to, in some ways, showcase or celebrate their marriage? Well, Joe and Marsha are polar opposites. I don't understand how they got together, but they have values that they share. Sure. They, they, they believe in family. They believe in helping people. I mean, they're very generous. And Marsha is very talkative. Joe is very yes, no. <laughs> and, and, and I don't know how they work other than through their shared values. For me, as someone who has seen this relationship from the beginning, I marvel at how they get along. I marvel at where, where, where's this guy? Who's, who's this guy? I don't know this guy. (laughs) This is a guy that would take Marsha out on chocolate dates and he would take her for rides around the city in his little, uh, well, I can't think of what kind of car it was, but he had a little sports car and he would drive her around the city and take her on shoe dates. Who is this guy? This is the guy that I went to high school with. And when we got out of high school, we started going to clubs, dancing six nights a week. And I mean, we would dance from midnight to 6 a.m. in the morning. I never knew he was a romantic. This is a guy that listened to heavy metal rock and roll and then at night would listen to dance music and disco music. <laughs> Where did this romantic side of him come from? So when they he proposed to her at, at the top of the town and I found out about it, so you, you took her to the fanciest restaurant in town at the time, proposed to her, and so you guys are getting married? What a remarkable thing. And so I always stored their story in my back pocket because as a writer and as a journalist, you're always observing people. Sure. And I just thought that, man, you know, one day, just one day. And so I've been involved with their family for decades, know their kids, have been in their kids' life and seen their children get married. Just as a a bystander and an observer, they had a story that I thought was worth telling. Justin, I know that you also worked with someone named Silk Allen um, Mm -hmm. to tell her story, uh, Not Married. It's titled, My Dad Thinks I'll Never Get Married, and (laughs) I'm okay with that. (laughs) Why did you choose to include that perspective? Yeah, well, so Silk was just someone who participate, chose to participate in the workshop. I was always hoping that someone would want to tell a story about why they didn't get married or why they don't want to get married. And that person turned out to be Silk. So <laughs> we didn't imp- impose that idea on her. She wanted to tell that story. She has a really interesting story, and I think we might have a clip if we have time to play it. Yeah, we sure where, do. Um, she came, her parents were in a non-traditional relationship themselves. They had her, but were not married at the time they were mar- and then ended up getting married to other people but then did get married to each other later in life and she has some really fun and emotional <laughs> conversations with them about uh, that influence of their marriage on her perspectives on marriage so I didn't grow up with my parents being husband and wife I often wonder the effect that had on me But when I talked to my mom, she said something that made me think beyond society norms and traditions when it comes to marriage. It's all about the person and not the word. You've got all kind of people married to all type of different people. Everybody's relationships are different. It's not written in concrete that, you know, this is what marriage really is. Marriage is about those two individuals and how they make it work. And so that was like a... a (laughs) <laughs> That's her mom's perspective. But if you listen to the full story, which I think <laughs> dropped this week, you hear her dad has a very different perspective where he's like, yeah, you're never going to get married because you're too much. And she's like, I'm too much. Everybody else is too much. So it's just it's fun because I think those are the kinds of conversations, unless you do a story like this, mm-hmm. you don't have a chance to have those conversations with your parents ordinarily. Right. Yeah. Um, and so. I think what's really cool about this is like it does run the gamut because um you know, there's the institution of marriage, whether you want to participate in that or not. There's definitely different 
perspectives on a the difficulty and 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 hard work that goes into making them work, but then the reward of of having that partner, um, and then the choices and rewards of of maybe not stepping into a, um, a marriage. So it seems like a very honest series. Yeah. Um, you talked to another person or had another person who made an audio story named Bonnie. Yes. Who who had an interesting perspective on, yeah, making a marriage endure. Um, let's hear from, from her audio story. Want to know a secret to a great long-term marriage? Spend time apart. <laughs> Here's my husband, Alan. I think the main activity that I, I do without you is, is music. I don't think I'm a very um, skillful musician, but I enjoy it a lot. And and doing it more and more. Alan loves to play the guitar, but I enjoy creative writing. He bicycles, and I like long, meandering nature walks. It's the differences that keep things interesting. So, you know, I, that's a fun story because Bonnie Brewer Krauss, who is the storyteller there, she came of age in like the late 60s, early 70s during. Um, the women's rights movement and, and a lot of she and a lot of her friends just thought marriage was oppression like that was her initial thought about marriage and then so she tells the story of how she came around to uh, getting married and I'm wondering because <laughs> Lisa and, and Charlotte and I were talking before the show because you guys all workshopped these stories together yes. and heard mm -hmm. different so when when Bonnie said like oh yeah spending time apart my husband likes to play the guitar were you like ding 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 we need to hear that was that yes. a yes <laughs> yeah yes. so Lisa how 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 do you get time alone do you even think that's important are you a codependent or do you like to <laughs> to have space oh I love space I, I mean like you know when we talk about the handmade cards I used to make like I used to make a coupon book um, and sometimes the coupon would be like one hassle free fun day or more valuable would be like one day alone. Yeah. But we both know, like we need that. Mm -hmm. Well, and especially once you throw kids into the picture. Yes. Um, an idea of a day away from your spouse and your kids, like seems like a birthday present. Yes, yes. Well, if any of you out there want to make a comment on your marriage or your individual life, please call in. We'd love to hear from you, 216-578-0903 or 866-578-0903. So I'm curious to both of you, um, you know, we're trained in audio storytelling and we know how to use natural sound, which is sound from the environment to kind of bring a story to life and, and to use our own narration. Um, how did you find the storytelling and making process? Let's start with you, Charlotte. I found, again, because, again, I told Justin and, and Lisa, I have a background in radio, used to work in radio years ago. Um, it's just another genre. I mean, it's all storytelling. And the beautiful thing about this particular class was Trent made us aware of how the sound helps to tell the story, mm -hmm. to set the mood, to bring emotion. So it's about creating the ethos and the pathos. And again, I mean, I thought that the inclusion of sound was something that maybe some people did better than I did. But again, this was just my first time coming back to radio and I plan on doing it again if Justin <laughs> wants to work with me. But I Absolutely, thought that the anytime. use of sound just really helps to tell the story. And when I heard back the playback on my story, it was like, wow, they actually included, you know, sound from the 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 incident, the inciting incident, going to the beautiful Palace Theater and being in that lobby, that magnificent lobby, and Joe seeing Marsha across the room. And, you know, there's this music playing in the background. We went to see an Ashford and Simpson and, and a Taste of Honey concert, and there's the sound of that band's big hit playing in the background and it really helps to set the stage for how long ago these people got together sure. so i just think that that really helps to to give us some context to the longevity of their marriage and lisa how did you find um audio story making i learned so much i came from a print and online journalism background mm. so i hadn't thought about 
you know, the sound quality, room tone, um, and like how to bring us the story come to life with different sounds. Like for mine, we did like, you know, um, shopping for cards at a drugstore, sure. the crinkly sounds of the 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 cellophane, all of that. The music, the, some music, of the music, yeah, yeah, all of it. Yeah. Um, and just even like in doing the interviews, learning how to like be quiet. Um, that was hard sure, for me. I have a problem with that. <laughs> like not responding necessarily yeah. right away to what people say. Yeah, because right. I'm always used to being like, uh huh, uh huh. Mm-hmm. Right. But just being quiet, like that was hard to learn. And then, Justin, were you editing their pieces, or did they even learn how to use editing software? Because that can be tricky. We did not do that for this this one, Jenny. Sometimes we try, but that's kind of like, we kind of think of that as like another phase. If you really want to dive in, we could do that. So uh, Trent put together the rough mixes, and then we kind of fine-tuned them mm-hmm. afterwards. But they did do their own scripting. Nice. So they picked out all the, the sound bites they wanted to use and the sound ideas. So it was just the the technical assembly. Mm -hmm. We didn't quite get to that part. (laughs) But But trimming the stories, like I think, you know, Trent was advising us, like, don't interview, like, don't have these, like, long two-hour interviews. This Mm -hmm. is going to be, like, a four- to five-minute piece. And, like, learning how to trim for time instead of, I, I, I still you're not writing a thesis to... paper right you right. know you yeah so yeah. you you want to be somewhat efficient in how you do it mm-hmm. yeah. um I know that there was another story and that we're gonna hear a clip from dr T tell uh, yeah. kind of set the scene for us yeah so dr T uh, Carter is a Cleveland woman um she's a writer and editor she was on the show I think a couple of years ago because she had put out an anthology with literary Cleveland um, about black women in Cleveland. I can't remember the exact mm-hmm. title of it. And she's an advocate for black women in town. And she wanted to tell the story of a couple who, uh, so she's really interested in gender roles and women's roles. This couple started out with very traditional. The man worked, the woman stayed home with the kids. And it's been interesting because there was a turn in their marriage where now it's the reverse. The man stays home with the kids and the woman runs their business. I definitely have a different perspective on the possibility of marriage with regard to gender roles. It doesn't have to be the way that you grew up or what you've seen other people do. I realize that the gender role conversation is specific to each couple. So if you have mutual respect and see marriage as a team effort, the positions of the team are interchangeable as long as the mutual goal is met. So that's interesting. You know, Justin, you're married. Um, How has this whole project Uh kind of, yeah, let's flip the script, made you think about your role in your marriage, making it work, you know, the sacrifices and the gains? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, whether or not you do choose to get married in life, I think what's been really great about this series is everybody, just about everybody has experience with relationships. And really, that's what these stories are about. Um, Whether or not you choose to actually tie the knot uh, or not, it's I think everybody can relate to the idea of being with someone and how do you make that work long term, whether you end up, you know, going down and getting a piece of paper or not. Um, And so. I guess for me, what how I've reflected on this series is definitely I've thought about greeting cards more because <laughs> I used to make my own, too. Uh, but you just kind of run out of time. Um, and I don't know. And just it's also just been really fun to hear a little bit of Cleveland history, like Charlotte was was saying. Um, I think one one really cool part of your story, Charlotte, was that after your couple met, at the Taste of Honey concert in Playhouse Square, they went to a bar afterwards that happened to be a gay bar. That's where um, we. That's where we went. We, and they we, just hung out. We went. Th- th- they had the music, and so, and as part of my job at Scene Magazine, I covered that beat. I covered the dance music disco beat, and so we would go clubbing. We would go six nights a week, and we would go dancing. And so that was something that Joe did. And so he would bring everybody that he dated. He would bring them. We would go. It was a club called Tracks and Dimensions, and they were like on on West 6th and West 9th Street. And we would go there, and we would just dance the night away. 
And that's what we did. So there was nothing strange about it. For us, we went there because we liked the music and it was part of my part of my job. So I had a little column in scene magazine. So but one of the things that I wanted to to share was that you know, my, Charlotte, we I'm so sorry we've run out of time. Oh so goodness. I gotta cut you can tell stories yes. and, and we hope to hear more from you <laughs> and I appreciate you coming on. Uh, Charlotte Morgan here with us. Lisa Chu, and then Idea Stream own Justin Glanville. Love that you guys hit on marriage. You know, you know, there was a point when same-sex couples um, weren't invited to the Institute of Marriage, but now we can all lament and and celebrate yes. in in that as well. So, really talking about the personality and dynamics of relationships, I think is what's great about your project. So, uh, I hope that people will listen to your stories, um, and I thank you all for joining us. The Sound of Us series focused on the Institution of Marriage. Thank Thanks, Jenna. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Time now to take a quick break. On the other side, we bring you another episode of our music podcast, Shuffle. This is The Sound of Ideas. I'm Jenny Hamill. We'll be right back. At 947, you're tuned into The Sound of Ideas right here on WKSU, Idea Stream Public Media. Support for our programming today comes from... The Cleveland Museum of Art, inviting visitors to a once-in-a-lifetime exhibition. China's Southern Paradise features 240 masterworks, many never to be seen together again. Now through January 7th, only at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Tickets at cma.org. University Hospitals is here for everyone with Hometown Care. Nationally recognized by U.S. News and World Report at Rainbow Babies and Children's and UH Cleveland Medical Center. Learn more at uhhospitals.org slash awards. The Cleveland Orchestra, carols, choirs, and a visit from St. Nick. Holiday concerts with the Cleveland Orchestra and Chorus return this December. Tickets can be reserved now. Presented by CIBC, December 13th through 23rd at Severance Music Center, clevelandorchestra.com. First Federal Lakewood, helping businesses in the community bank with confidence for over 85 years. An SBA preferred lender offering loans, personalized guidance, and money market accounts with above average interest. More at FFL.net. Member FDIC. It's the Sound of Ideas from Idea Stream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for spending the hour with us. A prolific Canton hip hop artist is out with a new album he hopes will make a household name. On this week's Shuffle, Idea Stream Public Media's Amanda Rabinowitz talked with Jean P., the MC, about his pride for his city and the rhymes he says saved his life. It sound like black excellence. Jean P, the MC, Canton City, what I represent. Preserve the culture and what's left of it. How we call- Jean Pierre Johnson, who performs as Jean P, the MC, says his musical journey started with journaling and writing short stories. He said he had a pencil in his hand at six years old. I wanted to be a writer before I wanted to be an MC. You know, I always thought that was cool to see by so and so on a book. Even before I wanted to rap, I always knew, like, writing things down, I would feel better. So I always kept a notebook with me, like, writing poems, writing thoughts, things of that nature. Six years old, what made you want to start writing? My mom. My yeah. mom was a very smart woman, so maybe it kind of just rubbed off. I tried sports. I was a little scrawny kid, so I wasn't, <laughs> you know, it wasn't my thing. So instead of holding a basketball or a football, I said, I'll hold a pencil or a pen. So I always like to come up with stories and just be creative and that was just me. I always knew I was creative before I knew what creativity was. And she encouraged you? She did. She did. She encouraged me a lot. She was real big on education. Like she had me when she was young. Like she was I think sixteen when she had me. She wasn't fitting the stereotypes of what people thought a teen mother was. She was an honor student. She kind of encouraged me and told me, you can do these things. So even when I was young, she always motivated me to do my things I wanted to do and my dreams and my goals, whatever I wanted. As life got real for me up until my mother passed, the writing got a little more in depth. When she passed, hip hop and writing was really all I had as far as like keeping me away from things outside of um, music, you know, because in Canton, it's really, it was really easy to get caught up in things like trouble and crime and drugs and stuff like that. It's not easy. But I always knew, like, music and hip-hop was going to be what was going to take me to the next level. So, like, as I got older and started experiencing more, I found the outlet of sharing my story through writing. How old were you when your mom passed? I was 15 when she passed. Mm. And I was 6 when my father passed. 
That had to have been so difficult. Yeah, it was. Like the years I'm trying to develop as a man, as a teenager, I didn't have a mother and father, you know what I'm saying? So I had my grandmother and like mentors and things like that to help me. Uh, yo, where Simpkin at? Where McKinley at? Show a block where you might get your wig split at. No ass is sure that y'all was never really into that. But C and J hits made me get into rap. Shout out to the Northeast where they run deep, staying up late night. Talk about growing up in Canton. So growing up in Canton, I grew up on the southeast side and up until about I was six. And when my father passed, we moved to the northwest side. And then my mother got married and we went to uh, an area called uh, Plain Township. But Canton, it means so much to me, man. Like to see where the city's at now with the Hall of Fame Village versus years ago. And people would say they would quote unquote drive past Canton to get to Cleveland. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it feels good that people stop in Canton now to check out what's going on because the city is slowly but surely coming up on some great things. That's a great segue because I want you to talk more about your Canton pride. Mm -hmm. You love Canton. I do. <laughs> you know, that, that's funny you say that because when I was getting into hip hop, people didn't really understand like, why are you, yeah. why are you talking about your city so much? And I get that from my favorite rappers. Snoop Dogg talks about Long Beach. Ludacris talks about Atlanta. Jay-Z talks about New York. Why can't I have pride in where I come from? People would be like, oh, there's nothing in Canton. No, I love Canton. Like, I, I know the front and back. I'm the mailman there, so like I'm in the city, so I know what's going on. And we, we have a culture within our city, too, so I just love to share that with people who listen to me in other states and countries. Uh, you know I love my city. My city. From those that hate to those that rock with me. Rock with me. From every corner store to every avenue. Being at home, time here was what I have to do. We used to kick it in monument in the old days. Can't forget Macy Gray in the OJs. The MCs from here keep spitting y'all. Tell me when you started writing your own music. So I always was writing my own music. Crazy thing was my uncle, my Uncle Jerry, he was one of the people that got me into hip hop. Like he was in a group. In high school, I wanted to go to the studio, but I just never had reliable people take me, you know. So I said, when I go to college, I'm going to do my own thing. I ain't going to wait on nobody. I'm All these songs I've been writing, these rhymes I've been writing, I'm going to record them when I get to school. And did you? I did. At, at Ohio University? Yes. So that's where it started in 2008? That's definitely where... Uh, Jean P the MC got to start professionally, like recording wise. Like uh, wow. shout out to my DJ uh, Christopher Summers, DJ Ishawn. He gave me the first opportunity to record because he had an in dorm studio. I was recording like three songs a day and releasing a mixtape like every three months. So my uncle Jerry was like, "Why are you keep dropping the? You just dropped the mixtape three months ago." And I'm like, "Uncle, it's gonna pay off because people are gonna know who I am." And fast forward 15 years later. People are revisiting my older music and it makes me releasing a new album. How much music have you released? 23 albums. I'm still at it, word denies, life is good, but I'm chasing my ill man. Keeping it real in the world of fakes. 100. 100. Being grown is by learning from your mistakes. Facts, facts. Busy hands achieving more than idle tongues. Rappers run into the gram when they run out of funds. Crazy. I can't stress how many times that I have been through it. So over the years, what's been your goal? Is this, why do you do this? I got an album called The Way I See It. Mm -hmm. And I said, my purpose is bigger than Billboard. Do I want the opportunities of being a big signed artist? Yeah. You know, but I'm also a very realistic person. I got a 12-year-old son making sure he's good first, which is why I go to work every day and deliver the mail. But I, I want opportunity from this because I've been so consistent with it for so long that when people hear John, not John, they may think that's my first project, but they listen to this and be like, man, I want to know more about this guy. Yeah. So I kind of did it on purpose, even at 18, but I didn't realize I'd be making so much music because I was seeing guys that were rapping with me and then they would stop, but I was still going. For me personally, the music is like a timeline of me reminding myself where I was because I just keep wanting to go higher. You know, so John, not John, the newest album is just like, me feeling like I'm at the top, but I feel like I can go more and more and more higher. John P, the MC, one more time. That's not the, <laughs> what you want the song's the... called About You. Okay, so you just released your new album. It's called John, Not John, and 
that's definitely making a statement, isn't it? Again, I wanted people to put respect on my name and also for people to say my name right. Because, <laughs> again, man, it's, that's a pet peeve of mine is when people say John P. I don't like it. Can you kind of take me through the album? Okay, so at the beginning of the album, I have a song called Speech. It's like me and my grandma, she's trying to, like, learn how to use the talk, the text. She learned how to use YouTube, so naturally she know her grandson does music. So she was trying to say my name in the YouTube, but I'm like, Grandma, this is kind of an issue with me because when you try to look up John P, the MC, a whole bunch of other names going to come up. So she was talking into it like, Jean, John, Jean, John P. <laughs> and I'm like, Grandma, that's not how you say it. She finally found it after like 80 tries. Oh, wow. Say Jean. Say, say Jean. MC. Say Jean. Jean. No, no, no. Uh-huh. <laughs> But I wanted to start off like that, and then I have the it's called speech, and I have Pastor John Center on there from when I was younger. Um, my mom had these old home videos, so I found a home video of when I did my speech oh, when wow. I was like five years old. So I started off the album with that. My father is not dead. Jesus lives just as he said. Jesus lives just as he said. Thank you, sir. You, 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 uh. you. What about Southeast Side? Is that about Canton? Yes, it is. My my friend Willis Gordon, he ran for mayor in Canton. And um, that song right there is about how where I come from when I side of town made me the man that I am. Uh, What good things do you see about the city right now? I see one, our biggest resource, and the thing that I'm most proud of is our people. That is just, we've got such a great culture here. The art scene is amazing. Um, We've got so much potential in this town. That's why I think it breaks my heart to see the things like the crime rate, to see the things like the job uh, in town, to see things hey, yo, like our I said, this And I was trying to tell people, like, I'm doing this because it means something to me. And what does it mean to you? It's changed my life. It saved my life. I just love that I can use hip-hop as a way to have other conversations. Like, I can talk with about hip-hop and business. I can talk about hip-hop and education. You can incorporate hip-hop into so many different avenues and conversations of life more than just rapping like you can teach people through hip-hop thank you so much for being here thank you thank you that's jean p the mc you can find more episodes and follow the podcast at ideastream.org slash shuffle i'm amanda rabinowitz idea stream public media Shuffle, your backstage pass to Northeast Ohio's independent music scene produced by Amanda Amanda Rabinowitz with help from Brittany Nader. Shuffle's back on November 16th with a conversation with jazz singer Ava Preston. Now, tomorrow on The Sound of Ideas, it's the Friday Reporters Roundtable with Mike McIntyre. This week, he is joined by several of our reporters, including Karen Kassler down at the State House. If you missed any portion of the program, find us online or listen to The Sound of Ideas podcast. You can also hear a rebroadcast. That is tonight at 9 on 89.7 WKSU. I'm Jenny Hamilton. Thanks so much for listening. We will speak to you again on Monday. The dream came true once I started uh, seeing it. It's been a minute since I've been reminded how I'm a walking inspiration. Ain't no need to find it. Yeah. But I was in my climate. Changed my perspective on a ride back home from yeah. celebrating love at a finger that's black owned. Even them days You're listening to 89.7 WKSU Kent, a public media service licensed to Kent State University and operated by IdeaStream Public Media. Oh.